Wonderful. Good. So let's drop in. It's It's uh, been a I'm sure an active filled day for a lot of us and it's always nice to have this container together to practice, come home and rest. So take a moment, make yourself comfortable, whatever that is for you. Oh, so much, Baba. I'm glad you're home. I'm going to mute. Everybody's not muted. <laughs> Good thing that's all you said, Pam. <laughs> okay. I like Eve's suggestion of dimming the screen if you feel, if you're kind of facing the computer, but you could also turn in a different direction or dim the screen a bit so that the visual stimuli of the imagery doesn't pull you out if the eyes are open if the eyes are closed it's less of an issue it's up to you i like to take off my glasses and have my eyes at a gentle angle towards the ground in a nice comfortable way and then soften the gaze a bit. And when the eyes soften, it tells my mouth and jaw to soften. The muscles of the face relaxed. The chin slightly drawing in towards the throat lengthens the back of the neck. And when the space opens at the base of the skull, the brainstem, then the breath naturally deepens. Shoulders relax away from the ears. And notice if you're kind of slouching forward, draw the chin back, lengthen the back of the neck. Shoulders draw down the back and the shoulders uh, the chest is slightly buoyant, so there's a like a lift, a buoyancy at the heart space. The spine is nice and strong and in its natural S-curve. And yet the belly is soft and relaxed. Let the out-breath melt away any tension that you're holding in your back or sacrum or hips. Just telling the body it doesn't need to protect right now. It can let go. There's a sweet feeling of alignment with gravity so that the skeleton is nice and aligned with gravity, and yet the muscles and the tissues of the body kind of melt away from the bone, relaxed, feeling of letting go. The legs, feet comfortable, relaxed. The arms relaxed and the palms down on the thighs or Palms up, folded in your lap as you wish. And take a moment to arouse your motivation for your time, contemplation, meditation. And right out of the gate, let's begin with a little metta for ourselves. Spending some time with the breath, the breathing in as a turning towards, 
Turning within, meeting yourself where you're at, what's here now. Breathing into it and breathing out a sense of spaciousness, some more relaxation. The image is like a palm that's always facing outward, turning in, turning in to care and tend to the inner life. Turn your awareness inside. And let that feel like the light of the sun shining in all the crevices, the shadows, the dark spaces, the open spaces, everything you find. Feel that awareness like the sunlight shining into you. These different atmospheres and moods you may have been carrying with you today were not just one thing. We're the clouds, we're the sun, we're the sky, we're the mountains, the rivers, the trees. We have all of these in us all the time, in varying degrees. Just turning your awareness in and letting these parts of yourself be seen, be witnessed, and have space. Turning the light of your care, your natural sense of generous awareness in on to yourself. Give that to yourself. Feeling can be like giving yourself permission to just let loose, to just be. And turn that light of your loving kindness, kind of shine it down into the belly center. This connection with the earth, stability, presence. And yet there might be other atmospheric occurrences there as well. So just turning, even if you wish with the in-breath, turning in. With the out breath, releasing more space, permission to just be. The feeling at the navel and in towards the center of the abdomen, the pelvic bowl, front, back, side, side. Just breathing in and out. If you wish, you may even put your hands on your belly to help you come home to that hara, the center of your mandala, the navel chakra.
This is the intuitive center where our gut tells us the truth. Tune into that and let yourself trust what's there. A simple quality of being and not second guessing. The body doesn't lie. And feel that quality of presence when you embody the belly. This quality of being here in the moment, in the body, in the moment, to moment breath. Surrender to it. And then feel that nice stability and presence of the belly center supporting the heart center above. And breathe in, turning the light of your attention, your loving kindness into the heart space. And the out breath is a releasing, a feeling of opening, of kind of like aerating that space of the heart that might be a bit um, closed or guarded or maybe just lonely or sad just whatever you find there bring the in breath like turning the palm of awareness in shining the light and then exhale releasing and opening into space more spacious Remember the heart isn't alone, it's supported by the belly beneath you, like the soil of the earth from which the lotus of the heart grows, gains nutrients and support. So feel that support rising up and then opening the petals of the heart chakra with each breath, a gentle non-forced feeling warmth of presence, of openness of the heart. And if you wish, you can take your hands and rest them at your heart space to help you be there with yourself. Using the sense of touch to help your awareness come home to the moment in the body with the heart. feeling that 
both the heart and the belly come online. The belly is a sense of presence, groundedness. The heart is a quality of openness. And that, by extension, rises up and supports the head center. So again, turning the light of your awareness and your loving kindness into the space of the uh, domain of the mind, thoughts, hopes and fears, concepts, dreams, judgments, fear. Breathing in, bringing the light, and breathing out, releasing into more spacious, letting go. When the head center is supported by the heart and the belly, it comes online and there's a quality of wakefulness, sometimes called a luminous awareness. If you wish, you can place a palm at the third eye. Sometimes it's nice to place the other palm at the occiput at the base of the skull and just hold with love and care. And let any tension or holding, the weight of the world and the face, the jaw, the neck, the skull, just melt down, down through the body into the earth. And relax the arms if, when you wish. The in breath is the metta of turning in, looking, being with. And the out breath is a releasing and opening and acceptance, space, clarity, a wakeful, luminous presence shining through the clouds of delusion, fear, regret, all those clouds of the thoughts, this shifting, immaterial, arising yet empty like a rainbow in the sky. And feel how the belly center feeds the hips, the pelvis, the legs, all the way down to the feet. And then feel that warmth flowing up through the core of the body, the belly, on line with the heart. online with the head and they are all together integrated communicating resourcing each other the belly knowing the heart knowing and the head knowing all of that Is your wisdom manifesting through you? Imbued with compassion, the tender, broken, blooming heart.
our space as it opens becomes a portal of the tendril, interconnected, empty fullness of all of us. There is no separation of space and time, this connection through the bodhicitta heart mandala. Feel any remnant of separation or loneliness fall away, melt away. And bask in that luminous sunlight that pervades all of space. It is you, it's all around you bask in that glow and just rest in it. We'll kind of strum or tug on the heartstrings with some mantra recitation to the Buddha of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara. This blooming heart lotus is the image of the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum, Om, universal sound of consciousness like that radiant sun. Mani means jewel, Padme means in the lotus. Hong is the seed syllable for awakened mind. Om Mani Padme Hong. So we're praying, may this jewel in the heart of the lotus, the bodhicitta, the spirit of awakening, of compassion and wisdom, be born within all of us, pervade all of space. You can sing with me or listen along as you like. Oh, mani pad me ho, oh, oh, mani pad me ho, 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 oh, mani pad me ho. 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 
Feel the sound waves of the mantra and of the bell and your heart waves traveling out, bringing this prayer, this loving kindness, compassion, healing energy to all beings everywhere. You can take some time here to really dedicate these prayers for specific people, animals, the world, whatever comes to your heart. Thank 
you. Nice to be with you. Feels like it's been a long time. I'm taking a look. If you can turn on your video, that's nice. You don't have to. Of course, if you're just got out of the shower or something, don't bother. <laughs> yeah, it's always funny when you see people's frozen picture and it looks like they're really sitting there. Sometimes I have to double check and like, Dean, you look like you're there, but you're not. It's funny. I like Denise's flower. But, you know, it's a small group tonight. Why don't you unmute if anybody has anything they'd like to share or ask or... It's nice these smaller groups, you know, I feel somewhere we're more held or met in a way. Hi. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question or make an observation, as, you know, bring some some of yourself into this space you can you don't have to you know, if you're feeling quiet and contemplative that's great too i do have a slogan for tonight you know like elizabeth warren i've got a slogan for that <laughs> i've got a slogan for this uh, but we have time here how is hi. your practice lily hi long time no see hi hi I've been here. I've had my camera off some. <laughs> yeah, I know, right. Okay. Um, I've been here. Yeah. The, the, I, I'm having some stomach problems right now. And so the attention on mm -hmm. the gut was pretty uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. But then going heart to head was like oh i have these resources too it just was like really resourcing to to move through like that oh that's so cool thank you <laughs> i can imagine you feeling i don't know if this is what your experience is but when we have pain and we have to attend to it it's hard you're like get me out of here <laughs> get me out of here and then there can be a nice release when you're finally out and then you see all those other resources. Oh, well, I hope you feel better soon. When the stomach is off, it's like the whole system is off. It really does affect the whole feeling, the, the mood. So be kind to yourself, my dear. I'm glad you have the other resources there too. <laughs> and curing pills are really good. <laughs> Do you know those Chinese pills curing? You can get them in health food stores. They're good for us food up, you know, stomach upset, queasy stomach, diarrhea. Hmm. Yeah. Curing? Cur curing. Yeah, they're just, they're called curing, C-U-R-I-N-G, curing pills. I don't leave home without them. Like whenever I travel, I've got my curing pills for my stomach and my yin chow for my throat. <laughs> yin chow. If you ever start feeling an itchy, scratchy, sore throat, it's good. Yin Chow. I've been married to an acupuncturist for 22 years, so <laughs> I've learned a few little things. I'll attest to those curing pills and Yin yeah. Chow both. They're amazing, but curing pills are like, saved me when I was younger. Uh-huh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't use them as much now, thankfully, but they're awesome. Yeah. You know, if you eat something, you feel it's too rich or you're off or you've got some other issues, curing pills can really help anyway. <laughs> Let's talk about the health of the gut, <laughs> our microbiome. More neuronal cells in our enteric nervous system than in the brain, I've, I've learned. Yeah, so the belly has center as that quality of like grounded presence, like I'm here. You know, when you're in your belly, you're like, I'm here. Have you had these experiences in your life when your gut told you something, but you didn't listen because the head was over-resourced and then you wished you, you had? 
apparently the, the our gut senses things way before our conscious mind does. So the whole saying of follow your gut or listen to your gut or my gut told me this, there's something to it. So it's good to learn how to be in there. Like, oh, this, oh, here's the gut. The gut's talking to me. <laughs> What's it saying? Tanya? I was just going to say, it's interesting. I think I have to play around with it because I don't feel like I have a very good relationship with my gut. <laughs> so um so to speak <laughs> so I try to ignore it um not just from a feeling of like you know what's going on emotionally but just you know I tend to just like not want to think about my gut so um but yeah I think this is a really good uh, meditation to invite me to explore that so I appreciate that thank you thank you thank you for being you know, vulnerable and honest about that. Yeah, it's definitely like, it feels a lot like we're kind of it's just safe zone is from the head up or chest up maybe and not really pay attention to what's going on down there. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Especially as women, we're told, ugh, you know, ugh, we know that story, just flush it down the toilet. Like I've been listening to a really fun not, it's not fun. It's a beautiful, deep book by Ajahn Chah. I don't remember the name. It's something about, you know, the, the heart of Dharma or something. I can find it and tell you guys. But he keeps saying, you know, all these thoughts, this, that, like, like judgment of, on the body or hopes and fears. He's like, just notice it and then throw it in the, the, the um, trash heap. <laughs> just throw it in the trash heap. And at first I was kind of like, well, that's like, sounds easier than it is but it stuck with me oh yeah that thought just throw it in the trash heap <laughs> make it compost so like i don't like my body or my gut i don't you know it's too big <laughs> or too this or too that just notice that thought throw it in the trash heap Who else? Walt, yeah. Hi. Hi. So since we're focusing at least briefly on somatic issues and how they affect uh, one's meditation or how one's meditation affects them, I have something for you. Oh, good. Now this. Um, oh, your hand. Yeah, my. Um, oh, no. It's interesting because uh, I um, I tipped my uh, my uh, motor scooter on one of uh, San Francisco's unused streetcar tracks, kind of the same as as people many people do on bicycles. You know, you get caught in the track. Well, I was riding a motorized <laughs> vehicle. Oh my god! Anyway, so you know, I planted my hand into the pavement, and big deal. Um, but it's like everybody I've talked to says, "Ah, you know, it'll take two or three months. You know, you'll get over it. You know, you haven't lost any. You know, whatever. It's it's like it's not a really big deal. It's not serious, but." I never realized um, not really having had, sig well, I've had some significant injuries, but it's, it's like how much my hands get in the way. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're very useful, obviously, but it's like, I'm, if I'm trying to do something, it's like anything that I try to do physically, my hands are there. And it's like, I've got to brace them because my knuckles are like really swollen. And so when I go into meditation, it's like, okay, it's fine. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, this too shall pass type mm -hmm. thing. But it only goes so far because what creeps up behind that is, well, you know, you're an old man. And suppose <laughs> 
it doesn't pass, but it stays forever, you know? It's like, yeah. because, you know, you've done this damage and, and that's what really, um, you know, keeps hitting me. And it, it's very difficult to bring myself out of that. It's like, what if it's forever, you know? Even though they say, hey, give it time. It's like, oh, it might be forever. And it has been interfering with my meditation for probably about five weeks. I think that's, yeah, about five weeks ago is when it occurred. So it's like, hmm, any suggestions on how to approach that? I hear you. I mean, that sounds really painful. And I'm, I hope you do heal quickly. It's, it's not easy to have a part of our bodies taken away from us for even if a temporary time. And um, I'm sure a lot of us in the group have some, some sort of experience, maybe not all, but hopefully not all, but of chronic pain or pain in general, on ongoing pain. And it's true that the mind does tend to latch on and say, oh my God, <laughs> what if this is forever? And then the fear spiral happens. It's really important to watch that and to try not to let it loop, take too much loops around the track because then the neuronal pathways start to get more you know, familiar that way. And so whatever you can do to kind of break that, oh my God, forever loop, you know, maybe replace that with, oh my God, replace that with a prayer, replace that with visualizing light in your hand, like, like replace the negative thought pattern with something healing, because it's really a choice, isn't it there? And you have a fair amount of practice under your belt and, and mindfulness there. Um, mantra literally is mind protection. It's a word that has two compounds in it. It's man, man is manas, which means mind. And tra is, is a shortened form of traya, which means to protect. It's actually the same root as the goddess named Tara, who is the protectress. So it's a mind protection. And so I can't tell you how important, you know, of course you need to take care of your wounds, ice it, elevate it, do what you need to do to minimize the pain. But also in terms of the mental loop that can get in there, uh, try to uh, you change the channel, you know, with a mantra or with a different thought of healing. Yeah, I'm going through this, I go through the same thing with a different issue that I, I work with. And, you know, low back pain is an interesting kind of neuromuscular loop. And so even long after the inflammation and the original uh, injury is healed, we can get stuck in a neuromuscular loop. So the mind does play a big role in our healing. And we have, as humans with our frontal lobe, we have the capacity to say, oh, I see you over there. Let's come, let's come back. Like we do with children or animals, you know, come back, come back, let's go this way. See, see if that, I'm sure you're already doing a lot of this, Walt. So I'm probably just t telling you stuff that you already know. Well, it's but actually inspiring, the it's inspiring you. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the mantra, which is, Monday, you know, yeah, something that one can concentrate on. Um, uh, thank you. It's it's a it's a uh, a good idea. It's some chant others. it into your finger. Chant it yeah. into your finger. Yeah. And like blow healing energy. You know, like see light going through your fingers. Like recreate your reality <laughs> with your mind. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be helpful. It's the the main thing is I, I suppose like I've had cervical and and you know lumbar problems but it's like you know mm -hmm. hey this can be fixed and so you know surgery hmm it fixed it now i feel better and here they're saying no no surgery you don't need surgery just give it time and i'm saying <laughs> no 
Ah, so you get to work with patience. You know, my mentor used to always say, yeah. patience is the essence of Dharma. Mm. So this is your path. Your finger is your guru. Yeah. Your hand is your guru. I have to develop. Say, oh, to thank you, Guruji, <laughs> for my teaching. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you, Guruji. I heard May say she was with children and, and that they uh, were beautiful, fun, and very tiring. I think of the children as the guru. You know, thank you, Guruji, for teaching me patience. I really needed to learn that. Oh, my God. What do you think, Mace? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, anyone else? We can go to our slogan for the evening. Little main course. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to just uh, play around a little bit with my screens so I can see you and see my notes. So we're on number 43. We're nearing the end. There are only 59 slogans. So we'll probably get to the end by the end of the summer, depending on how fast we go or slow. And uh, who knows what we'll do after this. I have some ideas, and so I need to talk to Eve. But here we are still in the world of, you know, slogans for life. So we're in this, like, tips for mind training point, the seventh point. And so here's another um, slogan for our life, which is 43, observe these two, even at the risk of your life, <laughs> Walt. So observe these two. What are these two? Well, what this is referring to is a couple so that we can understand it kind of on a more literal level, but also on a more kind of uh, interpretive or relaxed, you could say less traditional level. What this is saying is observe the two primary vows that you've taken. So we're talking about the Buddhist tradition, right? So from a traditional point of view, you're on the path, you've maybe you've become Buddhist, you've taken your refuge vows. So that's the first vow is taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, the, um, the three refuges. The Buddha is the historical figure who lived 2,600 years ago, taught the Dharma, Dharma's teaching. Sangha is the community of practitioners. So it's a going towards that, recognizing that, that those three things are like a giant, beautiful umbrella in a very torrential rainstorm, <laughs> you know, or, or bright sunlight. You know, you're going for shade, replenishment, and refuge from the the throes of samsara. And then the other vow that they're referring to in terms of observe these two, one, so the first is the refuge vow, the second is the vow of the bodhisattva, which you find more in the Mahayana teachings explicitly, this middle phase of development of Buddhism that eventually traveled throughout all of like Tibet and China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Mongolia kind of a more north movement with the Mahayana. So in the Mahayana, you see this bodhisattva vow, which is the vow to awaken for the benefit of all beings. And so you guys are familiar with this. We start off m all of our classes with the bodhicitta, is the spirit of awakening, this mind or heart prayer of awakening, this aspiration to be of service, you know, and uh, so that's what this means, and, and this is so kind of, you know, observe these two even at the risk of your life, meaning that, you know, they can't take a, if somebody's threatening you with your life, you know, if you can hold those vows, they can't take away your dignity, and they can't take away that which is the ultimate refuge. What's interesting is, is that there are interpretations of the three refuges, by the way. You know, on a more historical level, it's more on an outer level, it's Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. But on a deeper level, the interpretation of the Buddha is also in terms of your own Buddha nature, meaning to ultimately take refuge in your own nature of your own 
awakened mind, the Sugata Garbha, this Buddha nature that we all have within us, it's basic goodness. And so that is also the ultimate Buddha, is none other than you. And so through practice and meditation, if we find that certainty and that experience, and we cultivate and uncover Buddha nature within it ourselves, then even at the risk of our own life, even at the moment of death, no one can take that away from us. We, we come home to that because that is essentially the deathless state beyond birth and death. Um, the whole practice of Dharma, especially the focus in Tibetan Buddhism, is to be ready for death, you know, to know how to come home to, to your own home base, your own home ground, so that when the physical body falls away, you're okay. <laughs> you know, it's this realization of like everything happened and nothing happened, you know, like I'm consciousness. So on, on this kind of more traditional interpretation, these two vows are like, no matter what, don't abandon your heart. Don't abandon your own deepest refuge. And it's true that no one can take that away from you. More generally, the two primary commitments also can be understood as um, right, is the twofold bodhicitta of working for the benefit of yourself and others. So these are like more seen as commitments. Often this is called the twofold aspiration, which is to awaken for your own benefit and the benefit of others. Twofold. So these vows are often given in like a more traditional setting where you might have a teacher who you find is... Um, is someone you want to study with, you might ask, may I take refuge with you if you feel like you want to become a Buddhist. So what makes someone a Buddhist? Taking refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. But you don't have to be a Buddhist to appreciate these teachings or meditate or benefit from some of these very kind of practical teachings, by no means. And even His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, you know, Keep the religion you were born with. If you have a heart connection with it, keep that. Don't, don't convert. But you can study Dharma if you like it and read and practice and do all of that, but maintain your connection with your, your, the religion you were given. I want to read a quotation from His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama on the refuge vows. It's talking about, like, why do we go for refuge? What brings us to that? He says, through study and reflection, we understand the origin of suffering and how it unfolds and is perpetuated. When we learn how to reverse this process and acquire the conviction that it is possible to be liberated from it, we also understand how important it is, if we want to break free, to have a correct view of the nature of things, that is to say, emptiness, the absence of independent existence, meaning interconnection, right? That everything is interconnected. Empty of separateness. And that can be very liberating. When we assimilate the meaning of the Four Noble Truths, meaning the truth of suffering, the truth of the source of suffering, the truth of uh, freedom from suffering, and the Eightfold Noble Path, the truth of the path, when we understand the Four Noble Truths, and particularly the possibility of the cessation of suffering, the third truth, and then the path leading to it, the fourth truth, the Eightfold Path, we acquire an unshakable confidence in the teaching, the Dharma, which is the real refuge. Then in the Sangha, 
the community of Dharma practitioners, and particularly the followers of the Mahayana, who are inspired by altruistic love and have generated the mind of enlightenment, bodhicitta. And finally, in the Buddha, the third jewel, or enlightenment itself, which is the ultimate accomplishment of the path of liberation. That confidence is not blind faith. It is based on real understanding. So only then should someone you know, go for refuge if you really feel like, oh, here is a way I'm recognizing there is suffering. Okay, the teachings that the Buddha gave on the way out of suffering make sense to me. They resonate with me. Then there's a, a feeling of confidence and a desire to go for refuge. So then now there's another wonderful quote, a couple quotations in terms of the bodhisattva vow. So normally you one would take the refuge vows and practice and study for a while and then take the bodhisattva vow after. Sometimes it can happen at the same time. It's a beautiful vow. I've witnessed Lama Tsultram Alioni do it many times at Tara Mandala, and it just touches me every time, you know people who've been on the path for a while but never t- like had already taken refuge but hadn't taken the bodhisattva vow. It's a beautiful ceremony. Whether you do a more traditional or a more kind of slightly updated, you could say your modern version like I've witnessed with Lama Tsultrim. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama will give the bodhisattva vow. I took the bodhisattva vow with His Holiness the Dalai Lama at his Kala Chakra teachings. So he'll often give it at his uh, larger teachings. I also, just a personal note, I took refuge when I was a little girl. I don't remember doing it. I did it probably just because my mom was doing it, and I was four, and it was with His Holiness the 16th Karmapa. And I remember him very vividly. I don't remember the ceremony or taking the vows, but I remember being really impressed with him, and I, I know it is that experience at the Black Crown ceremony. He gives this ceremony where he goes, he puts on this black crown, it is said to be made by the hair of the Dakinis. It is said to have been actually like materialized out of space. <laughs> and he puts on this crown and he goes into samadhi, meditative absorption. And he becomes Avalokiteshvara, the Buddha of compassion that we prayed to at the end of meditation. We did his mantra. So he visualizes like he imagines himself and he goes into samadhi and he, he becomes the deity. You know, people probably just still see the Karmapa. They don't see him. I'm going to show you a picture. Um, And then he transmits light. And he basically goes into samadhi, into meditative absorption, and meditates on purifying all beings' karma. So his light emanates out, and he's like sending healing light out. Uh, Maybe you can see this is an old picture of him. So he's my root lama. His holiness, the 16th Karmapa. There's a 17th Karmapa who's a young man now. Maybe he's in his 30s. Um, So... You know, it's good to go for refuge in someone you have faith with and in. And it's also good, like, if you have children, to not push them into taking refuge. <laughs> like, they act, depends actually prefer kids to take refuge when they're conscious of it. <laughs> like, I remember I wanted Tejas, or was it Tara? Yeah, Tara to take refuge. And the Lama said, is, is, are they aware of what that is, and do they want to do it? So I checked with them. And he said yes. Uh, Tara took refuge at age six. I don't think Tejas has taken refuge. My son, who's 12, is a total atheist. <laughs> he thinks religion is bullshit. So we'll see what he does. Um, but I love him for it. We have good debates. So how many people have taken refuge before? Um, is that okay for me to ask? You don't have to answer if you don't want to. <laughs> 
Has anyone taken refuge? Just curious. It's not a value judgment. A few people have, yeah. Are some people thinking about it? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing to feel into. Can I throw something in there? Yeah, Mace. Um, I think I think that one of the interesting things about refuge is that um, it, it can be hard to find someone to take refuge with. Yeah. It's like to me, like there's a certain sort of like course or path of being a student um, and, and then more formal sort of, like I've actually never, so in the, obviously, as you know, I, I studied um, in the Tibetan path with, you know, you and Lama Sultram and that's where all the refuge was offered in my time. I've never yeah. known um, Spirit Rock to offer a refuge ceremony. I've never seen it advertised yeah. by the Sitos. I've never seen it advertised at Insight Redwood City. Like, so I don't really know if it happens. The And, I, and the only other place was like kind of um, more Zen. And so yeah. I wonder sometimes in this particular format, you know, I've, I've wanted to talk to the board at times or in the teachers to say like, could we have a refuge ceremony at the Dharma Collective? Because yeah, it's not, at least in my experience with the Vipassana world, very, uh, a formal ceremony. I have never encountered a formal Vipassana refuge ceremony. I don't know. That if anybody is knows. so interesting. I haven't thought of that. I just assumed they did them like we did. <laughs> you know, That's a great point, Mace. I wonder, um, I wonder if the nuns, the wonderful nuns who teach are allowed to give, give refuge. That might be, you know, if you have connection with them, if we have a connection with them. Yeah, it's true that like, in a way, you know, we're such a collage of, of traditions here at SF Dharma Collective in an intentional way that we don't have like the Lama of the head of this place who would give a refuge ceremony. I can't give a refuge ceremony. Um, but if we wanted to offer maybe a, a little choice of few, <laughs> yeah, people could choose early, middle, or later versions, you know, of Dharma refuge. We could talk about that. It'd be beautiful. They're beautiful ceremonies. And like Lama Tsultrim has done them online, and we were afraid they would lose of some of the magic, but they were beautiful. Uh, but yeah, that could be interesting, actually. This raises a very interesting point. It's a, it's a beautiful commitment when, when one wants to make it. It can be really a life-changing thing. It should be considered very carefully. We could invite the Dalai Lama. <laughs> yeah. Right, and it's true, Diane is reminding me that His Holiness uh, Dalai Lama has ended several of his recent Facebook Live teachings with the Bodhisattva ceremony. And maybe he says you don't need to have taken refuge in the three jewels, you know, the formal refuge before doing that, if he's giving it so widely, maybe he's just like, hey, you know, whoever wants it can have it. In the in the traditional refuge ceremony, usually you'd get a name, like you get a Dharma name, you get a refuge name. And then you could choose you use that or just choose to kind of file it away. And uh, so I so bummed my mom lost a little card of my refuge name with the with the Karmapa. I was like, how could you lose that? <laughs> okay, so I want to read another a couple quotes about the Bodhi uh, Bodhi uh, Sattva vow. This is by Yongye, this is by Mingyur Rinpoche. Yongye Mingyur Rinpoche. When I began to practice meditation on compassion, I found that my sense of isolation began to diminish. While at the same time, my personal sense of empowerment began to grow. Where once I saw only problems, I started to see solutions. Where once I viewed my own happiness as more important than the happiness of others, I began to see the well-being of others as the foundation of my own peace of mind. Interesting. And here's a quote from Shantideva, the author of the great classic Dharma text, The Bodhisattva Way of Life. 
He was one of the greatest uh, Mahayana Indian masters. He wrote, All the joy the world contains has come through wishing happiness for others. All the misery the world contains has come from wanting pleasure for oneself. Is there need for lengthy explanation? Childish beings look out for themselves while Buddhas labor for the good of others. See the difference that divides them. By bringing joy to beings, I please the Buddhas also. By wounding them, I wound the Buddhas also. Here is a quote from one of my favorite teachers of all time. I received a teaching from him right when I came home from India in 1997. And when I met him, and I didn't meet him, like I didn't shake his hand, but when I saw him in the auditorium, like literally he walked, his name is Nyoshul Ken Rimshe. He walked into the room and everything changed. Like it, it, the fabric of space opened up. I mean, the guy was a walking Buddha. Like I could feel it. And I was like, I am going to study with this teacher. This, one, this is my teacher. And then I, then like a few months later, he died. <laughs> so, don't waste time. You know, if you meet someone who you know is like you've got karma. They're not easy to find. Don't waste your time. You never know what might happen. I'm still heartbroken about that. Missed, missed chance, you know? Like, there aren't a lot of great... There aren't, like, the old good ones. You know, they're not around very much anymore. <laughs> you have to really find them. So, Nyosho Ken Rinpoche, he said... Why is bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, so important? Because, because it is the immediate antidote for attachment to that sense of I that is the origin of samsara, the cycle of suffering. The unfounded belief in an illusory self pushes us to cherish ourselves and reject others. When finally which finally turns against us and is the main cause of our sufferings in samsara. It is therefore essential to meditate all the time on love and compassion until we love others more than ourselves. That is the lifeblood of our spiritual practice and must always remain so. This is the path we're on, you know. Some of you might just be one foot on the path or both foot fo feet fully planted on the path. But he's being very clear <laughs> about this path. It doesn't mean we're going to get it all right and we're going to do it perfectly, not at all. But it means that's the intention. How's, how does your heart feel with that one? Feel free to unmute and share any of about any of these quotes. I could read this again if you felt like you kind of want it again. Do you want it again? Yeah, okay. Why is bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment, so important? Because it is the immediate antidote for attachment to the sense of I that is the origin of samsara, the cycle of suffering. The unfounded belief in an illusory self pushes us to cherish ourselves and reject others, which finally turns against us and is the main cause of our sufferings in samsara. It is therefore essential to meditate all the time on love and compassion until we love others more than ourselves. That is the lifeblood of our spiritual practice and must always remain so. Okay, this is so brilliant. This is why I love Dharma. Basically what he's saying 
is like clinging onto this illusory sense of I that doesn't even really exist, pushes us to cherish this illusory self more than others. So we cherish ourselves and we reject others. And this, this act, this dance, it, this cherishing turns against us. And it's the main cause of our suffering. <laughs> so this is what's so brilliant about Dharma. This is why I took refuge, because it's telling me the truth. Like, oh, it comes back to me. You know, I can straighten this out. I'm just speaking the truth for me. I don't care if you take refuge. You know, well, I'm not invested in any of that. I'm not trying to talk anybody into it. I'm just saying, for me, this is what lit me up. Like, oh, I'm caught in a illusory dance, and I've been dreaming this whole time. And little flashes of wisdom like that flash, you know, like a lightning in the darkness. You see around you like, oh, wow. Here's where I've been, floundering in samsara, trying to get happy by cherishing myself. <laughs> and it's only been making me more and more miserable. <laughs> so let's try cherishing others more. Man, that's not easy, but it's so beautiful. Like, oh, you glow, you get all the praise. Let me help uplift you. I don't need that. You know, the mature pe people, you know, when we get, you know, age is so great, isn't it? You get more mature. <laughs> and you realize, I don't need that shit anymore. Let them have the limelight. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy when you're happy. You know, Denise, please. Just real quick, how does the Dalai Lama do that over Zoom now? Is it like some of his heart sutras and other things? Yeah, yeah. He he gave yeah he gave teachings. He's been giving a lot of teachings, and I went to one a while ago. For and refuge. At the end, at the end, he gives the Bodhisattva vow. So what I was saying is I don't know if he says, okay, you can take this vow if you've already taken refuge. I have a feeling he's probably not even saying that. He's probably just saying you can, anyone can do it if you want to do it. Yeah, because he's doing things that are so, but so I should just check his schedule? For that check one. his schedule. If you can take the Bodhisattva vow with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, there's nothing higher than that. Well, he was the first one that was so incredible when he walked into the room that Mm, for you otherwise you yeah it's just, it, it, how do you find out about those things you gotta you know find teachers that you resonate with get on their email list call you know email their their admin and say i'm i'm sick of wandering in some sorrow and i want to take refuge <laughs> well, it took in a desert you know i need to some shade. Yes, but the, the Bodhisattva, the That's second Bodhisattva. one, seems already present, and that seems like the most, um, the most fun. I mean, it's a protection all the way through, but, um, but what you said about the person who walked into the room and then he was gone, I was thinking, it's, is there is there more? It seems like there is more. I mean, you feel it through Zoom if you take refuge. Yeah. Hey, Zoom. I don't have any problem with Zoom. If it's in real time, you know, like you couldn't like watch a recording. You know, it needs to be live. Yeah. But there's no space time ultimately, right? So, right. And so it a lot of lamas more and more are giving these over, over Zoom. And I think it's great. And the Dalai Lama is getting older. Yes. So do it. If you can make that tendril, that tashi tendril, that auspicious interconnection with a living Buddha, like the Dalai Lama, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, when he dies. <laughs> you know? 
Yeah. But there's still, I mean, we we will survive, you know, and then the Buddha within and all that, blah, blah, blah. But still, like, he is a special dude, you know, like, take as much as the teaching from him as you can, get the refuge, even ask refuge, email his office. There's the office of the Dalai Lama. You can email him. (laughs) Email the office and say, when is he giving a refuge ceremony, a bodhicitta, bodhisattva vow ceremony? If you have a connection with him. Now, if you have a beautiful, con- if you have a strong connection with an unknown lama in some small town, just as beautiful, just as powerful, because you've got the heart connection. So lama, it's it's the heart, like you feel the heart, like you cry, you know, like you, you weep. That's it. That tells you. Those are signs. Tingles, chills, weeping. You know, those are signs. Yeah. So funny how we live thinking, oh, it'll just keep being the way it is, you know, and then suddenly everything changes. Okay, let's see more info here coming in on the chat, right? Um, yeah, read the chat. Some good comments. Right. Yeah, exactly. He'll offer the Bodhisattva vow um, frequently, but not at the end of all of his teachings. So you could find out. And I don't know, you know, sometimes lamas are spontaneous about that, where you'll be at a teaching and then if enough people ask, then they'll say, oh, um, we'll have a refuge or a bodhisattva vow ceremony at the end of this retreat. That's what happens at Tara Mandala with Lama Tsultrim. You know, she might not be planning on doing it, but like if there's momentum and people ask for it, then she'll make space for it. Beautiful. Such an honor to witness that. You know, I do, and you can recommit to, you know, also with the bodhisattva with the refuge and maybe also with the bodhisattva vow what i wanted to talk about tonight also are the five precepts so those are also like vows that lay people take and usually it's folded in to the refuge um, ceremony and it might be refreshed also in the bodhisattva uh, vow ceremony Uh, but they're beautiful um, precepts that are pretty common sense the first is to um, care for life, to not kill. The second is to um, respect what is belongs to others, meaning not to steal. The third is to speak the truth and speak um, in a benevolent, you know, speak with a good intention, not to lie. The fourth is to um, abstain from, or to refrain from, well, okay, I'll say it in a positive light first. So the fourth is to respect the sexual commitments and, you know, boundaries of others and yourself. Refrain from sexual misconduct. So, of course, that means not, not interfering with the commitment or relationship of another, right, of others. And likewise, respecting your own commitments. And then also, of course, abstaining from any kind of sexual abuse or any kind of, you know, that goes without saying, but respect boundaries. And then the fifth, of course, is uh, to um, stay kind of in your kind of um, clear sense faculties and not to get intoxicated. So that means... That doesn't mean you can't have a glass of wine or a beer from time to time or a little dram of some good scotch. (laughs) But just don't get drunk, you know, or don't get so um, clouded to the point where your judgment is hindered, right? Because when we are addicted to things or we become intoxicated to where we lose our best judgment, we cause suffering to ourselves and others. So it's pretty common sense. And those five precepts are very commonly held by lay practitioners like me. You know, I do my best. doesn't mean I don't 
kill an ant from time to time or a mosquito or something. Oops. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, and then oh money put me home, you know, <laughs> like pray for a higher rebirth. And um we try, you know, we're working. These are aspirations. So any questions or comments about that? So that's the basically kind of the understanding of like this slogan, like re re hold those two primary vows as best as you can. And um, and if you're not Buddhist and you haven't taken those, the Bodhisattva or the refuge vows, it just means to try to be of benefit, make a commitment to be of benefit to self and others. It's kind of a more universal way of understanding that. Any comments or questions? A beautiful analogy is, I'll just say this and then Denise, is like in the beginning of our spiritual path, we're like a little baby redwood tree and we need some protection, you know, because deer or other animals can come trample on us or eat us up, right? So we, you know, we need protection. So like protection of our sangha, our teachers, our community, you know, we want to be around healthy, you know, positive influences, people who care for us, who love us, you know, we don't want to be buffeted by the winds of negativity and abuse, right? So we need to find refuge. And then over time, we grow, we grow, we become more nourished, more, you know, empowered, more certain in our path and our, our what we, who we are. And so then we grow to a big, 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 giant redwood tree. We don't need those little fences or protections anymore. And then we can be a refuge for others. We can provide shade and shelter. And that's a beautiful metaphor for refuge, right? Denise? This may be a question for another time. I think that was the whole closure. I just keep wanting to ask you about eye contact. I, in meditation, not so much contact, but I like to look up sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, looking down and sometimes having your eyes closed. And sometimes you instruct us to do something in particular with our eyes. Is there something we should read or look at or consider in relation to um, what we do with our um, mm. our gaze during meditation? I mean, I try and do walking meditation too, so I know we want to be doing it 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> but just in terms of specific practices. Any of the meditations that I guide, you can do looking up. You know, that's a very common Dzogchen as you maybe you have. Have you learned Dzogchen? Sky gazing? No? So you've probably got karma with it. <laughs> There's some other forms too. I'm a, Dzogchen's not the only one who sky gazes. But with the Dzogchen tradition, you actually gently look up slightly above the horizon and then rest the gaze and mix awareness with space. You know, you're just becoming one with the sky. And uh, and so it opens that lifting the gaze opens uh, subtle channels called the it's the crystal channel called the kati channel that connects to the heart. So when the eyes are lifted, they say it's more open, and that leads to deeper practices. Later, you know, further on down the path of trekcha and Togil. But um, so if you have a propensity to lift the gaze and meditate like that do it. It's wonderful. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. So eyes closed are good for certain forms of meditation, like if you're, like the four measurables, we often do those with the eyes closed, where you're kind of actively cultivating or going on a journey, you know, because by taking the visual field away, it helps you do the journey without distraction. 
And then slightly leaving the eyes open, gazing past the tip of the nose is the traditional way the Buddha taught of meditating, just softening the eyes, not staring at anything in particular. And that's wonderful. We do that a lot in the settling the mind in its natural state. But really what that is, is a preliminary foundational work to get you ready to lift the gaze, actually. <laughs> but, um... So really, you can find. And in Dzogchen, they have all sorts of different gazes. Sometimes they have you look to the left, the right, up, or horizontal. The horizontal is called the bodhisattva gaze. <laughs> You're just looking straight ahead. The, the eyes up um, is the vidyadhara, the knowledge holder gaze. Right? They, they have all these different names for the different kinds of gazes. So with the eyes more lifted, it's opening that kati channel crystal channel that goes to the heart, which is different subtle body anatomy than the Hatha Yoga and the Tantric tradition. This is more Dzogchen. You don't find that channel spoken of in Tantric Yoga. So that's that's all I'll say for now. But uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. It's good to ask those personal questions because now like Denise, now you're like, okay, you know, follow my gut. <laughs> Trust Squeaky, my yoga teacher used to always say, <laughs> you know, and Squeaky Da Lu, what, Sque what did Squeaky say? <laughs> that inner voice. Okay, let's dedicate the merit. May we all learn to listen to Squeaky. For the benefit of all beings. Emaho, how wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Um, I think Eve is with you next week. So, all the best. I, I'll be here the following week, and then I'm going into retreat on June 29th for three weeks. I've got a cabin at Tara Mandala, and I'll be. Mixing awareness with space, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and under the beautiful Colorado sky. And just so you know, Tara Mandala in southwest Colorado has amazing retreat cabins. So if you ever want to take your studies and go and put them into practice in a very sweet little cabin, um, I think it's 200 square feet. It's got a little kitchen. Most of them don't have running water, but they provide water. You have a solar shower outside, compost toilet, beautiful views, comfy bed, place to do yoga and have a shrine and meditate, decks that you can meditate on. And they'll bring your food once a week. They have a little, um, like an ice box at the end of the road. So you can, um, when you're out of supplies, you can leave a note in the ice box. They'll come and check it out, see what your shopping list is. They'll go shopping for you and then come back and put put the food in there. <laughs> uh, Taramandala.org, you can check them out. A lot of them are booked now, you know, but you can do it in advance. They're very popular these days with COVID, you know. So um if you want to go they i think they do a minimum of three or four nights but usually they like people to go for at least a week we've had people in one year three year retreats there so it's a really magical part it's really the heartbeat of tara mandala it was lama tsultrum's main purpose was to create a retreat center where people could go and do deep retreat so okay good night y'all have a wonderful evening big love I'll see you before I go do that, though. I'll see you once or twice. But I'll be gone for most of July on retreat. Yeah. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Thank you. Take care.